Now, this idea of the Canadian identity, for me, it was always sort of a mysterious thing uh, growing up. Uh, it's not something I really, I ever really thought very much about. And it was really only when I started becoming political that the question even dawned on me, well, what exactly is Canada? What, what does it mean to be Canadian, you know? And I guess the more we think about it, and I'm sure everyone here has struggled with this in the context of what we've known, the discoveries that we've made, looking at how the world is actually operating, uh, that there, there's not much of a direct answer that we get when we ask somebody, well, what does it mean to be Canadian? So I just throw that out there. I mean, what do you, what do you folks think so far our identity the identity, what does it mean to be Canadian? What is a Canadian identity? Does anyone have any thoughts? We need to live both handy ways. Okay, okay. <laughs> but polite. Sure. Uh, sure. Hold of the dollar short and day late single. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You got a lot of Tim Hortons. We're not American. I, the, when I, the, the thing I usually get uh, that people re reply immediately is, oh, I'm, I'm not too sure what Canada is, but I know we're not American as if it's some sort of a badge of honor. You know, they say we have the biggest underdeveloped landmass in all of the world. Hurrah, what pride. <laughs> so, these things, this is weird. This, this actually, you, this used to be seen as an, almost a touch of immorality to say, oh, we haven't done anything with our landmass. We have this great resource in the world. We can do so much good to say, to, elevate people's lives to a higher state of status of dignity, including our own, and we're just not touching it. And this used to be, in past generations, something that you would be somewhat ashamed of, like, oh, you've been kind of lazy. Mm -hmm. And yet here, people are actually thinking, oh, we're green. That's good, you know? And the, the important thing, the important reason to think about this now is we do, we have had a strategic shift politically over the recent um, months and really the last few years in Russia and in China. And really this culminated uh, last year when Vladimir Putin fired uh, this British operative, or this British trained operative within his government, who was the finance minister of Russia, uh, Kudrin. Right? And he literally, Medvedev, who at that time was the prime, uh, president, went on public TV, li literally told him, if you don't want to adapt yourself to the new policies of national sovereignty and long-term development of this new government, you're gone. And you might as well just you know, pack your bags and leave. And that was a big scandal. But since then, you've had now a commitment by Russia to adopt programs for the Bering Strait uh, connection, connecting in through Alaska and into Canada. This is a program that Russia has openly made their national policy and have openly uh, put aside a huge portion of the funding that will be required to build this. They're building all of the Siberian region right now. Uh, there's new science cities and corridors and bilateral uh, programs with South Korea, India, and China for energy, hydroelectric power, and rail. China has also undertaken uh, over the past, really the past hand, several years, some of the biggest ambitious programs of the Yangtze Three Gorges Dam. Right now they're undertaking the Move South Water North program that's going to be greening huge portions of the Gobi Desert. And space. So these nations, these nations are actually the only ones left in the world that have active programs for lunar and Mars mining, asteroid mining, and greater uh, scientific exploration of uh, the solar system. And yet when you organize, like Paul, like Ravi, like Mark, like myself, and like some of you probably have already done, the nations or the people that you talk to when you ask them, well, what do you think of Russia and China? You know, the response you tend to get is, oh, that's, that's a, that's a corrupt, those are corrupt dictatorships. Right? Those are, those are the, they're the ones protecting people like Bashar al-Assad, the other dictator who's killing his people. And yet, for some, for some reason, these are the nations which are the, on, the only ones actually standing up for humankind who have actually intervened to block us as an imperial uh, set of colonies under NATO from going into bl from, and blowing up places like Syria and Iran. So you've got to wonder, what, what created this anti-Americanism, this anti this, this idea that any nation which is engaging in large-scale development for the improvement of its, its own uh, society is bad. Right? They're making top-down decisions. Top-down, that's dictatorial. Right? They didn't have a consensus to, build the, to develop the Siberian region. China didn't have a consensus to build the great hydroelectric water projects. 
They're just going ahead and doing it. That's dictatorial. Here we have democracy. But then, after listening to something like Paul's briefing, you wonder, well, is that really a democracy that we're living in? Right? The most devout fascist programs that are coming out of the, the world right now are coming out of the European Central Bank, coming out of Obama's personal circles, coming out of those people who are pulling the strings on Stephen Harper. And yet most people are not all that concerned about this type of fascist police state apparatus that's been built up around our ears. So it's very important now to, rec to, to redefine where exactly this insanity came from, considering that the Nawaba program, this return to a Franklin Roosevelt orientation, coming from the United States, which our movement is leading there, and which Canada has to be a part of, is the only way out of this crisis. So the irony here is when you bring up things like Nawaba, oftentimes people say, oh, but the Americans want to steal our water. That's bad. You, know? you can't trust them. They, they, want to, they want to take our resources. But you think about it. We're, every time in history where America has worked with Canada in large-scale uh, development and, and organization of our resources, Canada has had the biggest bursts of liberty, of progress, of industry, of infrastructure, and of political freedom at every point. And every point we've stopped this and have adopted a program of speculation, you know, free trade, the very opposite has happened, the programs that we're currently engaged in. So again, is that just a coincidence? Like, is that just, you know, did that just happen that way? People just unfortunately became anti-nation state and anti-progress? Or is the case that there's actually been a thought-through program to embed the culture with this type of uh, lie? So... The topic of the class is the American system in Canada redefining the paradox of the Canadian identity. And um, the key here is that one of the, one of the biggest reasons why people, uh, authorities on history are completely incompetent when they're evaluating what is Canada, how did we come to be where we are, is that one, they're, they have no idea in, in general of the existence of an American system of economics. They just don't know that that exists. And they're completely incompetent when it comes to the subject of power and this idea of work, such that the entirety of Canada's experience of development has occurred when, and when I say, just to be on a segue, when I say American system, I don't mean, well, you, you guys all pretty much are not newcomers here, but this is not an American system as such. This is a universal system which has been best exemplified by the policies of the American uh, tradition against empire and for nation building. Now this has been expressed in Canada over the years and the entire identity of Canada has been derived of either an attempt by the British who have been controlling Canada for a long time to crush that American system or by those patriots in Canada who recognize the validity of this system to adopt it. And this is something which is completely written out of our textbooks. And the, the idea here really comes down to the, the, a concept, a concept of, this concept of progress is very important because you either are going to adopt the idea that there is a fixed amount of energy to accomplish, to always extract less and less of as there's more and more people, which will always allow you to do less and less work to sustain less and less people as new constraints are imposed on your population, right, and operate under that type of logic, or you'll take the opposing, the opposing view, which has it that if progress is truly infinite, right, if progress is truly unbounded, then how is the case that we, how, how would that be possible since our resource spectrum that we utilize at any given moment is always finite, right? If it is true that progress, the potential for progress is unbounded, as is maintained by those uh, representatives of the American system, then that means that what determines value is not the money or the, or the physical material resources. It's the process of the mind that moves from one lower grade resource to a higher one, which is in itself, as a mental phenomenon, unbounded. Mark? Oh. No, it's not going to stand. So at what point do you say that creativity doesn't exist anymore, right? It, what, I'm out of creativity. I've used it all up, right? It's gone. Well, maybe when you physically die, yeah, you'd say that you're not going to be producing many more poems. 
but since we're not alone in this, right, society preceded and will come after us, we have to recognize that the creative powers of mind that we, in our brief lifetimes, experience are not, they don't disappear with our death. These are, this is a process that we participate in that goes on unboundedly as long as there is life. Sure, sure, I understand. Mm, it's okay. All right, so we got a question of mind and matter, right? In the most simple essence of what we're dealing with, in, in evaluating this historical battle that brought us here, is the idea of whether mind is what governs the changes in matter, or whether matter is what governs how mind must behave, right? In one system, you get death. In one system, you have always a greater opportunity to increase life qualitatively and quantitatively. And that's like at the essence of it, which we'll look at and how this developed a little bit. Uh, in two epochs, at uh, two points in recent so-called his Canadian history. <laughs> this idea of mind and matter and matter and mind, or American and British systems, uh, was, best, was exemplified in one uh, speech given by one particular Canadian patriot who we're going to look at a little bit tonight named Isaac Buchanan. Anybody here, has anyone here heard of Isaac Buchanan already? Yeah? Some yes, some no? Okay. So this is one of the greatest Canadians. The fact that we don't know about him is one of the greatest scandals. And he lived around the time uh, before and just a little after Abraham Lincoln's victory over the Confederate South. Isaac Buchanan was an industrialist, uh, he was a politician, but we're going to look at just a quote he took from an American political economist named Ezra Seaman, who was commenting on the uh, condition of Canada uh, in 1848. And Seaman write, writes, or actually, Seaman is quoted from Isaac Buchanan as saying, Though the ratio of the increase of the population has been greater in Canada than the United States, Yet their increase of wealth has barely kept pace with the population, and they are all as poor as they were half a century since. They have enjoyed the blessings of free trade all of the time, we only part of the time. Whenever we have attempted to supply ourselves by our own industry with the comforts and necessities of life, we have improved our condition as a people. And during the intervals of free trade and large importations of foreign goods, we have relapsed again into a condition bordering on bankruptcy, while the Canadians have been constantly exhausted and kept so poor by free trade as to be unable to get sufficient credit to have the ups and downs of prosperity and bankruptcy in succession. And so one might ask, well, why is it that Canada today is really so underpopulated, right? After all of these years, we've been around for quite some time. <laughs> we really only have 30 million people or so hugging the border of the United States. That's it. Seven major cities, sporadic rural towns. Nothing really going on. And the world that people like Isaac Buchanan were living in, in the mid-1800s, didn't look that much like the world we're living today, even geographically speaking. Because what we're dealing with there, this is a familiar territory, but the policy of free trade was never really about the money. And when you start looking at, well, does anyone know what this uh, big green blot is in the middle of Canada? Oh, the Canadian Shield? Or? Nope. I think it's the Hudson's Bay Company territory. <laughs> I think you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, company, the, the Canadian Shield wasn't as big as the Hudson's Bay private company's territory. Now this is something which people know cash cropping, right? What? Cash cropping. Currently? Yeah. Well, yeah, currently. I mean, the principle of cash cropping, you know, this is a, a phenomenon people usually associate with globalization. Oh, we've gotten... You know, India's good at rice, they'll do rice. Oh, you know, Mexico, they're good at Walmart textiles for, you know. Corn. Yeah, well, they'll do that. They don't, they don't have to do rice, though, or corn. Uh, they can do that, because corn, I mean, that's, we have, the U.S. has to do corn, that's for the biofuels. So you can't, 
you have to, if every nation just does one thing and no nation tries to spread itself out and doing everything, you're going to make more money that way. They'll be really good at that one thing. Yeah, maybe they won't be sovereign. They'll have to go somewhere else for their food. But they'll make more money. People often today associate that as a, as a new thing. This is actually a long pro, uh, imperial logic, which was exemplified by the Hudson's Bay Corporation, which was a subsidiary of the British East India Company, which maintained for hundreds of years the famous fur trade. Right? We do fur. That's Canada. There's a lot of beaver. Right? We do some wood, too. That's Canada. We export cheap resources. Um, yeah, forgive the pun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's Montreal for but in terms of actually developing industry and infrastructure, no, that's not possible. And every time that people who like Isaac Buchanan and others who I'll bring up a few were actually fighting, what they were fighting against was this logic, which was an imperial logic that they understood, where people like the Hudson's Bay Corporation paid native tribes that lived across these lands to kill anybody who would wander in without an official Hudson's Bay license. So if you were actually wandering in without that official license, you were risking your life. So most of this territory was completely unknown for hundreds of years. They ran this from 1650 all the way till the end of the 19th century. Nobody knew what the hell was up there. You weren't allowed to have any prospecting, no nothing. So the, the intention was never to make money because, you know, yeah. Because yeah. if it was really about money, you would think, well, why didn't we just develop those resources, right? Resources can be converted into money. And so it really was about suppressing something that was going on right below Canada. And for the past 250 years, the bane of the oligarchy's existence has been the advent of, the, of America. A few of the Canadians that we, you know, that we could look at, and there, there's a certain handful. I should put on four here just to give an example. But there, on the left is William Lyon McKenzie and Louis Joseph Papineau. Uh, people know who these two folks were? 1837, that Yeah. So, as an example, you had, for the first burst of freedom in Canada, that we didn't really part we didn't get really on the bandwagon in the American Revolution. That was a bit of a scandal, too. But the first real burst of freedom came from the, uh, the uprising in, well, you've got... Canada, as we know it, really com comprised, for most of the, the 19th century, Lower, Montreal, Quebec, and Upper Toronto, uh, the Toronto region of Canada. And there, in 1837, you had two rebellions simultaneously occurring between French Canada and, uh, and the Upper, led by Papineau and Mackenzie. Papineau had a bit more of an idea of a protectionist system, a constitutional republic. Uh, he had read everything by Benjamin Franklin. And, the problem of both of these rebellions, which were uh, squashed by people like Lord John Russell, who led uh, the British in crushing this rebellion, was the fact that America at that time, sadly, did not give the support that was expected by many of these Canadian patriots since who was the president in 1837-38? Jackson. Right. And right after Jackson, you had his uh, sponsor, Martin Van Buren. Both of these guys were devout Anglo uh, British lovers. So they turned a complete cold shoulder, leaving a lot of these folks to hang, which many sadly did. But again, the spirit was alive, and Mackenzie uh, founded a very influential uh, series of newspapers, getting across American system and national development ideas to the population. And this reached a point where we're going to focus on primarily uh, the second half, not the first half of the 19th century, with the the writings and the, the activities of Isaac Buchanan, the guy there in the middle, or the third from the, uh, from the left, uh, your left. So, what we had, right, was a process where free trade had run amok, even in the United States after uh, Andrew Jackson for decades. This destroyed the population, this destroyed the, the industry, and this led to a, a, a tension which had been built up to the point of a, of, a, of, a, of a civil war. Canada, most people don't know Canada's role in this whole process, but 
Isaac Buchanan was famous for ensuring that Canada would not participate as a British outpost against Lincoln in uh, who was trying to keep the nation and the Union together. People like Henry C. Carey in 1859 even commented on the danger of the role of Canada and the breakup of the Union. When he was writing that, uh, already the British are congratulating themselves upon approach, approaching dissolution of the Union and the entire reestablishment of British influence over this northern portion of the continent. For proof of this, permit me to refer you to the following extracts from the Morning Post, now the recognized organ of the Palmerston government. If the northern states should separate from the southern on the question of slavery, one which now so fiercely agitates the public mind in America, that portion of the Grand Trunk Railway which traverses Maine might at any day be closed against England, unless indeed the people of that state, with an eye to commercial profit, should offer to annex themselves to Canada. On military as well as commercial grounds, it is obviously necessary that British North America should possess on the Atlantic a port at all times of the year. A port which will make England equally, in peace and in war, independent of the United States. If separation is to take place, the Confederate States of British North America, then a strong, comp then a strong compact nation, would virtually hold the balance of power on the continent and lead to the restoration of that influence which more than 80 years ago England was supposed to have lost. And that's the end of the, the quote from the newspaper and Harry, Henry C. Carey goes on to say, look where we may, discord, decay, and slavery march hand in hand with British free trade, the British free trade system. Harmony and freedom, wealth and strength, on the contrary, growing in all those countries by which that system is resisted. So, by the early 1860s, after the war had already begun, America had seen a huge influx of British soldiers, many, all uh, occupying Upper and Lower Canada and ready at any moment to pounce. Uh, the intervention of Isaac Buchanan was very important in this, along with the circles that he represented, because not only did they expose this for what it was, but led the fight, uh, that led the fight in government to ensure that Canada would not participate. And this was also occurring with the help of people like uh, Tsar Alexander II, right? who many of you know, who brought all of the fleets of Russia off the coast of, of uh, the Atlantic as a sign to any uh, European nation like that of Napoleon III or the Spanish Habsburgs or the British, that if they were to back up the British in going in to suppress Lincoln, that this would be more with Russia. So. The interventions worked well, but it wasn't just that. The idea of Buchanan was you needed to have a strong uh, community of sovereign nations in North America working on economic cooperation, what was called the, the Customs Union. And the Customs Union was something he had advocated for a long time in order to, add, to build up more rail development, more canals like the Welland Canal, uh, connecting Lake Erie and Lake... Uh, Forget Ontario. Ontario. Yeah. And many other developments uh, with the help of the United States uh, as an ally. And in a, in a speech, after, this is 1863 now, in a speech uh, that Buchanan gave, which was very influential uh, in Ottawa, well, he lays it out. And I figure I'll just read some of these bigger ones, but we're going to get out of quote territory pretty soon um, and into the nitty gritty. But he writes, I guess nobody can see these things, but the most appropriate thing that could be said in reply to the toast was that the, inter the internal improvements of the country would not be encouraged by the present government. It appeared to him that there was a great and obvious determination among the radical statesmen of England to interfere with our responsible government in tariff matters, and no ministry had ever gone so far in the, in the direction of countenancing them as the present men. The true economical policy of Canada is to promote the prosperity of the Canadian farmer. And how is this to be done is the simple, simply political question of the Canadian patriot. True political reform, such as we had before the Globe came to Canada, the Globe being uh, the paper of his arch ne nemesis, who we'll look at in a second, um, and also the Globe and Mail today is the, uh, the fruits of that. 
is the globe, uh, the globe as the, such as we had before the globe came to Canada, is in a progressive state of society such as we have in America, the truest conservatism. We must be economical not only in applying the people's money for their own benefit, but in securing for our own people all of the employment we can, in making the articles we require, seeing that when manufa the manufacturers live in a foreign country, they are not consuming the productions of the Can Canadian farms. No country can have this without having a manufacturing population to eat the produce which is, which is not exportable. The adoption by England for herself of this transcendental principle of free trade has all but lost the colonies, and her madly attempting to make it the principle of the British Empire would entirely alienate the colonies. Though pretending to unusual intelligence, the Manchester schools are, as a class, as void of knowledge of the world as of patriotic principles. Cheers. As a necessary consequence of the legislation of England, Canada will require England to assent to the establishment of two things, on the subject of which time did not permit him now to further enlarge. First, an American Zollverein, and second, Canada to be made neutral territory in time of any war between England and the United States. That's just this section. So, you definitely have a very overt, and under, overt understanding of the idea of Henry C. Carey that manufacturers must coexist with agricultural, agricultural production. You can't have them separated as you would under any cash cropping logic. But more importantly, oh, the Manchester School, by the way, that's the, the famous school of uh, Thomas Malthus, all of the Benthamites, all of the British uh, crazy uh, monetarists. But you really had an understanding that you had this Zollverein idea was what American system economist Frederick List brought to Germany when he created a unification of the German states for, you know, basically allowing for a high protective tariff on exports coming or imports coming in. But then you have to have cooperation among the local, you know, areas of Germany too. So for that you will have a free trade, but it has to be subsumed under a principle of a large scale development program. And that's the Zollverein idea. The reply, the attack, came two weeks later. It took a long time for the Globe to scramble up uh, an attack led by George Brown, who was the editor, and a really evil fucker, um, in general, of Isaac Buchanan. And they finally wrote in, re in reply, the conservative press are all unanimous in their expressions of its approval, that is the speech. It was a great speech, a regular screecher. They endorsed the sentiments it contains, the principles it sets forth, and not for many a long day has, has such an excellent speech been given to the world. So they all declare. In other words, England must give up free trade, a principle which, the farther it is carried out, the greater has her prosperity become, a principle which is seated deep down in the beneficial power of which is recognized by the greatest thinkers from Adam Smith downwards. Or what else? Why the people of the colonies, smarting under the intolerable wrong done to them, will rise against this imperial authority and forswear forever their allegiance to the Queen, or the Crown. Mr. Buchanan believed that, as a necessary consequence of the free trade legislation of England, Canada would require England to assert to two things. First, an American Zollverein, and second, Canada must be made a neutral territory in time of any war between England and the United States. What a modest proposition. If not, according to Mr. Buchanan, the inevitable result is that we shall, as did the 13 colonies, become separated from the parent state. Buchanan intends that Canada should be left to herself to protect her territory with the power of peace or war thus given to us with all British com commercial interest in us destroyed by artificial restraints. What else should we be but an independent country? That is, were all these things to have occurred, it seems to be that Buchanan is implying that Canada should become an independent country. Ooh, uh, shame, eh? So, Indeed, you really do have this. It, Isaac Buchanan is risen to prominence simply, this is January 1864 that this reply was written. 
And by July 18th, 19, 1864, Buchanan becomes the president of the executive council, which is the most uh, powerful position of authority in, in the Canadian government, uh, by the McDonald Taché government. And he begins implementing the biggest wave of programs uh, ever imagined. And he begins a dialogue with the leaders around Abraham Lincoln uh, to begin immediately establishing a open uh, a flow of trade to lower the protective tariff between Canada and the United States to allow for an increase of commerce, but to increase a huge protective tariff on goods coming in from England, who had at that point monopolized much of all of the, the actual productive capacities of the world. So this was an idea of just cutting, you know, cutting America off of the umbilical cord, going with the United States. And the problem was that coup d'etat was, was pretty much performed a few months later when the government fell. You had the cancellation of what was called the Reciprocity Treaty between the United States and all of the infrastructure initiatives were cancelled. So you basically are left with a country that has no essential purpose as such but to defend the interests of the empire. And that's essentially what we're left with at that point. Lincoln, well, here before we go into the next round, a little uh, a timeline is occasionally a useful thing when you have an idea of a principle governing it. Because what happens, right? Immediately thereafter, Lincoln is assassinated, right? You have Alaska is purchased by the United States for $7 million, right? So the Russians who, saved the, who helped save the United States go and sell for peanuts to the United States uh, this whole territory of Alaska in the north. In that context, you see that there's an intention building up. You, we're looking at this whole pro-nation state, pro-development orientation. And you have what today school books teach is the celebrated confederation, the birth of Canada. Well, really, what was the confederation, right? Was this really the, the start of, the Canada, of Canada as a nation state? Well, no, actually. This is not a fight against empire. This was a warm blanket that was granted in order to give certain legislative authority to the government. But at the same time, stop it from working with America and becoming a customs union, and becoming a real sovereign nation, a republic. So you were able to sidetrack all of the real pivotal discussion on nation building and just bring it back towards, well, we finally got a constitution. After all these years, it was granted to us by the monarch. She granted us, or he granted us, these different rights that, that he could take them away, but they're there. And as you got this legalistic thing, which pretty much just says right up front that Canada's role or uh, raison d'etre is to defend the interests of the British Empire. And that really in the 1867 Constitution is exactly what it says. So this is occurring, and at the same time you have the Hudson's Bay land, which is purchased uh, by Canada for, I think, a few million dollars. You have, in 1867, uh, 1876, the American centennial is an expression of the success and superiority of the American system, right? And nations and leaders all around the world begin implementing this immediately thereafter in their own nations, from Germany to the Ottoman Empire to France to Russia to Japan, right? And you have this going on in a certain way. This is adopted by people uh, like Thomas Coltrane Kiefer, who we briefly looked at, but we're not going to have time to look at today, a uh, friend of Buchanan was part of the, the leadership uh, around Laurier b building up this national policy, this idea of maintaining a protective system to encourage rail development, canal building, and what have you. So this is going on. Uh, Canada is not fully on board with this, obviously. Uh, Lincoln is still assassinated from Montreal, right? You have complete, uh, that's, that's remains, that always remains a confederate uh, holdout and base of operations for the duration of the war and then thereafter. But unbounded progress is the new system. And Britain is going through the biggest Great Depression of its history. It's, it's known as the old man of, of Europe, right? Britain is going down. So there's a period of great potential all around where in 1878, 
Kiefer unveils, he's a representative of Canada in the Paracentennial Exhibition, and it shocks the world that this small country has, in a period of just several years, managed to produce more machine tools than every other nation except for Germany and the United States. Right? Canada was actually, there was, uh, through the patriotic circles, a real expression of uh, freedom. And the British, their only way that they could uh, react to this process was what I've just, you know, dubbed here the, uh, the assassinations galore epoch of from 1880 to 1914, where it was a very dangerous time to be a freedom-loving uh, leader of any country, where you just look from James Garfield to, to McKinley, right, to Sadi uh, Carnot, to Alexander II, to pretty much everybody, almost everyone, who was advocating and applying this American system, you had the biggest wave of assassinations which were necessary to unleash hell on earth, which happened in World War I, this was followed by the British orchestration of hyperinflation in Weimar, the bringing in of a Great Depression after the Roaring Twenties failed, right? And were it not for the intervention of Franklin Roosevelt, the world by this point would have already been under a deep dark age for already over 80 years. Right? So it helps you, when you think about things from this standpoint of a fight over ideas, it really helps you appreciate being alive a little bit more and appreciating also what we can do today in similar dire straits. These are not a, this is not a new phenomenon. So the New Deal is unleashed, right? World War II happens, and then we're going to settle on the period uh, where we have this, the reemergence of the fight over a second Zolverein idea, the second customs union. Now, this is from 45 to 68, and this is much more intense. A lot of people here were probably young kids growing up around that period. And this is a defining period uh, which determines a lot of current history. The big discussion after uh, Hitler, the, the Wall Street London Hitler project was stopped by the intervention of, of Roosevelt was what would this post-war world look like. And the key thing was this, this idea that we have now more people than ever, a growing birth rate, more so than every other period of history, a greater expectation of progress, of hope for the future than every other, every other history, uh, point of history, and certain needs will, will occur as we see that this is, a, this is happening, right? You have water, a, a dire absence of water in the West Coast. You have the need for energy to sustain growing people and growing uh, growing necessity for industrial production to sustain more people. You have more cooperative corridors and more, more things that involve nations working together on geographical problems. And this is what was defining the discussion. Really, you could say this was already going on uh, really at the end of the 19th century. People like Laurier, who I didn't bring up here, uh, was a great advocate of also exporting water to the United States, uh, working in Laurier is another character who we have to look more into, but um, he ha also has a certain quality of visionary uh, to him, where he actually he written extensively on how he saw Canada stretching from coast to coast with high-speed electrified rail, and 60 million people by 1926. Right. So the problem, though, is Laurier was living in the period of the you know the assassinations galore period where it was a very dangerous time to, to fight like hell. And he did fight to a certain degree, but within the context of World War building up and all of these things. So you had the intention already. Uh, you had a water uh, boundaries treaty signed in 1911 under Laurier. Uh, the problem, though, is you had people like, at that time, again, bad timing, kind of like the uprising of, of the patriots in Upper and Lower Canada in the 1830s. Who did you have in office at that period? Well, you dealing with the effects of Theodore Roosevelt, and then you have Woodrow, the Ku Klux Klan guy. Right. So these two uh, Anglophiles have no interest whatsoever and start embarking upon applying uh, conservation policies, in the banning of interbasin water transfers, and other things that just are overtly intended to block such 
cooperative developments. So this now obviously is a new discussion. It wasn't permitted to, to take place uh, during the Great Depression, during the Roaring Twenties, during the World War, but now it's come back to play. So you have now an increasing idea of developing the North, the East, the West, and that's really defining Canada here at this point. Because on the East Coast, what did you have with Roosevelt's, the completion after Roosevelt died of the Great Lakes Seaway, right? For a long time, the Great Lakes was the big challenge of how do you get uh, an active uh, shipping and commerce line in from the, from the Atlantic into the Great Lakes and into the continent. When you have huge rapids, it's impossible to get large ships through. And this was something that you know, people, even in the 1650s, tried dealing with, uh, with the Lachine Canal. People like Cartier, who was a friend of Colbert in colonizing and developing Quebec. Uh, this guy had an idea of actually building a canal that would permit this to happen. When you know he tried, he tried going a, a certain way in, hit the rapids, and said, "Well, I was really trying to get to, the, to China, but I'll call this part of Montreal, China. It's Lachine. That's where I was born." That's all right, boy. Uh, and then went back home. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so you had immediately. This took by 1850. You know, by 18, 200 years later, you had a certain canal being built up, but the canal was almost useless for any major ships because it was only maybe five feet deep. Right, not that wide. You couldn't have any big containers go through, but it was mm. so. The Great Lakes Seaway, the opening up of this whole region, was really only completed in, in 1959. It was really kicked off in, 18, in 1955. Roosevelt wanted to get it done sooner, but you had the British blocking it. And so that that was going through. Hydroelectric dams were being built on the west coast. Well, on the north. You had, uh, under Diefenbaker, a project called the Northern Vision to create new science cities deep, deep into, the, into the Yukon territories that would accommodate uh, all the needs under a modern uh, quality of living, one of which was called Frobisher Bay, which was supposed to provide all of the accommodations of uh, life expectancy in Toronto within a completely climate-controlled city. This is the late 1950s, wow. under Diefenbaker. Uh, the specs for this thing are wonderful. So you had a huge idea of developing the Arctic. You had an, a concept in the West uh, of a great need, looking at all of the dryness and the, the complete absence of precipitation that would occur in the lower, uh, the lower part of the continent. With, I mean, I think it's something like 40 percent, uh, 40 times more uh, evapotranspiration and precipitation that occurs in BC, the Yukon, and Alaska relative to California, Montana, these lower places. So. You had really an idea of managing your resources. Um, the Columbia River uh, Treaty is where we're going to touch on today. Most people know here the ins and outs of Nawapa, so I'm not going to go through a lot of this. We've seen the videos. We, know, we have a certain idea of what this is about. But this was a conspiracy, and this is something which we really have to dig even more up on. Uh, but the Columbia River Treaty is a really core aspect, looking at just what Nawapa is, you know, in terms of moving 72 million acre feet of water down into the continent, even into Mexico, filling up the Great Lakes. Uh, the job creation potential is amazing. The power potential would be amazing. But this is something which we know was conceptualized by a private company called the, the Ralph Parsons Engineering Corporation. We know it had a congressional committee advocating and fighting for it under Frank Moss. We know from the Nawapa videos that we've seen and that we've uh, produced that people like the Kennedys, John F. and his brother, were advocating for such projects uh, devoutly. And people like, you know, Diefenbaker and even Pearson, who for all of their problems, uh, and they did have problems like, you know, Avril Air's destruction wasn't the best idea ever. However, were uh, very, very excited and did advocate the idea of opening up and uh, permitting for water exportation to green the deserts of the West as the next platform in the development of Canada. So the key here is that this is not just a US uh, initiative. For this could not have occurred because, well, it already did begin in a sense. The, the Nawapa has already begun and a lot of people don't, get, don't realize this. And you only get this when you start seeing that the Columbia River Treaty was not an isolated four or five dams the way we've sort of treated it today 
to deal with some piecemeal thing. Um, this was part of a larger scale vision uh, fought for by a guy who all of you probably know, W.A.C. Bennett. Right. And W.A.C. Bennett, again, is a very slandered fellow. But, again, kind of like Putin, right? He's declared as a oh, top down decision making believer in progress. He must be a tyrannical dictator, anti democracy. Right. Um, and most people who I've brought this up to on the street actually tend to have a very negative emotional reaction to the guy. Um, until you actually start reading his, his works and, discover, and looking at what initiatives, what, what programs were being unleashed in British Columbia at the time of his uh, leadership. And this man was 20 years, right? This is, I think Putin was in there for a while. It's 20 years of being a premier uh, for the Social Credit Party. This guy was originally in the 40s uh, heading the Post-War Rehabilitation Council. The big discussion was in 41 and up to the end of the war, all of these young men who are coming back home from the war, they're, they need something to do. They've got to be put to work. We can't just let them fall onto the streets. What do we do with this influx of able-bodied people? <clears throat> right? That's a big crisis. And so he laid out a blueprint uh, with a team that he was working with for the large-scale uh, development of British Columbia and the Yukon and Alaska. And he immediately got fighting for it, but encountered a lot of resistance time you had a, a conservative liberal coalition, they were doing some good things, but there wasn't a lot of like, openness even then uh, to, to going with this program. Because where's the money going to come from? You know, it's the same type of little debate you would get from a lot of these monetarists. Um, so he, he dropped out of the conservative party and he joined the social credit. Right? The social credit was really, really ragtag, especially at that point. You didn't have, I mean, a, of everybody who he, he just began organizing for months. And he recruited a shitload of people to run for office. These are people who are farmers, you know, uh, machine tool operators, mechanics, right? Not really, these are not politicians and they won. All of them won. So you ended up having 19 seats won uh, by social credit, 18 by the uh, NDP, the Committee of Commonwealth the Federation, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, liberals and conservatives got almost nothing. So anyway, he's left with the majority, with the, with the government, right? And he has to fill his cabinet. Nobody has any legislative experience. So he pulls together all of these guys uh, who just have real experience in life. <laughs> and he forms a cabinet. And immediately starts fighting. He has a lot more clout, but he still gets a lot of resistance from Ottawa. Because he wants to immediately go ahead and start building rail. And he does. The, the first thing he does is rail. And this is just this, uh, again, looking at what, what occurred in BC under this guy's leadership is astounding. So before he got in, uh, you had the Vancouver, North Vancouver Squamish Line extended to Quesnel uh, that was built starting in 1912. You had Quesnel Prince George that ended in 52. And then under his leadership, you've got Prince George of Dawson's Creek in Fort St. John, Fort St. John, Fort Nelson, Prince George, Fort Nelson, you know, you talk you to landing at Deese Lake. But that, you look at all these initiatives, who was going somewhere with this? And they weren't permitted, not all of them were permitted to go through. And a whole set of propositions. So this is what we have today. This is the current layout of rail that's left in British Columbia. We've got, obviously, from North Vancouver, going all the way to Fort Nelson. That has been built. You have uh, Dawson's Creek, right? This does exist. Little things of the Mackenzie. And this region here, all the way up to Tacky Landing. That's, have you guys heard about the rail, the rail to nowhere that's selling for a dollar? In the States? Or no, no, in here. Yeah. yeah, in Canada, if you have a bike, you can buy a uh, few hundred miles of British Nowhere, really? Like a uh, land bridge to nowhere. Toronto's freeway to nowhere. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's, you know, W.A.C. Bennett, he was crazy. He built a fucking rail line to nowhere sort of language, but you were, Crazy, right? Well, no, no, actually. When you actually look at the proposals, uh, this was what it was supposed to extend to under Bennett's original uh, design. All the way up to Dawson, uh, that rail line to nowhere, right, from Taki Landing. That's a little, it's a little bent down right now, but Taki Landing is over here. Right? This is supposed to connect all the way up to Watson Lake, 
up to Carmax, up to Dawson, and into Fairbanks. Right. This is the Alaskan and Canada uh, rail line, which our ally Hal Cooper is leading the fight on in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the specs are all there. It, it all works. And it is why do you need so much rail, right? And you always want to get into the head of what's the general dynamic. Right? Keep in mind the traditions of Roosevelt are still inspiring people. You have a dynamic of progress under John F. Kennedy. Under de Gaulle, you have the biggest developments in France against the oligarchy. And, well, you want to support, right? You want to support for the industrial uh, activity that's going to be occurring in your pulp and paper mills. In your, mm -hmm. uh, you want to be able to transform the minerals that are on your land into something usable for export. export. You, you want to be able to start having the necessary power production to sustain these things. You need to have dams, right? You're going to... Yep. And that brings us into the second aspect. So the Columbia River Treaty, this is essentially the, um, the basin that we know today. Uh, this is what does exist. The Columbia River uh, Treaty involved uh, building simply these dams up here and Libby down there. The Grand Coulee was the biggest one that the U.S. had ever done under Roosevelt that already existed. The rest were also generally built around that period or a little before, but this was the key one. Because you have floods, you have droughts, you have unwieldy uh, weather, you have a great necessity for irrigation. And this program, it didn't go through right away. I mean, there's a few specs here. You know, you've got a discharge of the mouth of the, the Columbia River of 192 million acre feet per year. You got the, uh, the whole flow to the US from the US and Canada border is 72 million acre feet per year. Uh, the storage capacity of the Columbia River Treaty was 15.5 million acre feet. Um, it would offer flood controls, increase of U.S. electricity generation in winter, and uh, equally sharing of the downstream benefits. So the idea was originally uh, this thing was signed by Diefenbaker and Eisenhower in 1961 on the 17th of January. It didn't go through underway though. It, it was signed as a treaty, but then the paradox is, well, the, the treaty involved what? It said um, you'd have the Rocky Mountain Trench, it would end in uh, Washington State, you would have two dams being built by BC, which was the, uh, the Mika Dam and the uh, Keenly Side Dam. Keenly Side. Yeah. Forgive me if I screw up on my uh, enunciations here. And that would be here. Right, so the Keenly Side Dam, the Mika Dam, and what came to be the Duncan Dam um, off of the, Co the, the Kootenai Lake? Dunkin' Donut Dam? Dunkin' Donut Dam? Yeah, no, the Dunkin' Donuts. Um, and the U.S. would build the Libby. So that was the original policy. Um, the idea was Canada was going to receive about half of the electricity output from that. And yeah, the U.S. would get their flood control, their hydro water use, but it didn't go through, and the question is why. Well, Bennett had other ideas. Bennett didn't really, his whole point was, well, look, uh, we're very underdeveloped. We can't use half of the mass amount of electricity that's going to be generated from these things. It's nice, but we can't use that yet. We want to develop, though. We want to have industries. Um, so he, his whole idea was, we got to develop the Peace River. So, actually, this is kind of a hectic thing here. Right? Yeah. So, actually, might as well. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so a little back and forth happened over uh, the course of a few months. I'll read this out just because, yeah, it's better that I do that. But you have here that um, Premier Bennett tells the BC legislation that although the treaty will soon be ratified by the U.S. Congress, it will wait much longer for Canadian approval because it does not include the conditions necessary for BC to proceed. There is a dispute between the BC and Canadian governments which continues for over three years. Uh, Bennett says Ottawa should assist financing, but BC Power Commission is in control. Uh, Canadian government says, no, if Ottawa finances the Columbia River Treaty development, it has control over the implementation. Okay, not good. Bennett says, okay, um, 
if we sell, we want to sell the downstream benefits that we get from the power to the United States so that we can get some money to build up and develop the Peace River in the north, right? And the U.S. says no. Uh, the U.S. sends B.C. Uh, the Canadian government says no. The U.S. should send the B.C. share of electricity back. No sale downstream. Um, <clears throat> Bennett says no. We want the Peace River Dam for electricity and reservoir storage to develop the region. So the idea was, you know, we'll sell the water, the energy from the Columbia River to the states, while we, for our development, will have the dams that we need to build on the Peace River way up north for the use of people in Vancouver. In, uh, the, in the province and what have you. And the Canadian government says, no, the BC Supreme Court rules that the takeover, oh, sorry. Sorry, no, 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 no. No market for power of the Peace River. All right, there's no market for it. The Peace River's up in nowhere. You don't have that many people there yet uh, in BC, so you don't have a market, so you're trying to sabotage our plan. Um, Bennett, he goes and, uh, well, basically, he says, well, let's just use BC Hydro, right? You've got BC Electric, which uh, it's a private company. We'll just use them to build it. And, you know, BC Electric says, well, no, again, there's no market for it. We don't want to do it. So, all right. He just goes and he, he says, well, <coughs> screw this. Uh, we'll nationalize. So, BC Electric is then bought out by, by Bennett and becomes basically nationalized. It's a little, there's a little fight that goes through, but it's, it's determined that that's a fine action. It's within... Uh, it's within the law. And now Bennett has the complete authority. He has the upper hand. Now that he has control of this giant, you know, this giant enterprise that has monopoly over uh, dealing with electricity development, now we can say to the government, as well as the U.S., my rules, we're going to develop the Peace River. And as a speech given at a press conference thereafter, says this, Bennett, this is Bennett speaking, this is the most momentous announcement I have ever made. The studies being conducted in the north indicate the feasibility of establishing in the Rocky Mountain Trench the greatest hydroelectric project in the world, a project that would be entirely within the control of the government of British Columbia. This project would create 4 million horsepower and create a lake 260 miles long, so big that it would probably alter the climate of the north country. This is the most important day that BC has experienced in its whole history. Surely now, both Ottawa and the US will realize we mean business. This means the development of British Columbia. And this is his uh, famous two river policy. And this is, this is Nawapa. You, you'll find that this is the Peace River uh, up in that region. That's the entire basin, Upper Columbia. Um, when you actually look at When you actually look at the original Nawapa designs, Peace River up here, well, this is the Rocky Mountain Trench, that's Peace River. This requires the very dams that were built. This, is the, this becomes the Bennett Dam. This was not, uh, the, yeah, this becomes the Bennett Dam. You've got the Wollaston Reservoir up there. The entire idea was to have a portion of the water runoff from the Liard River and the other rivers up north channel off before they enter into the Rocky Mountain Trench. Right, this is part of the, this is the Columbia River re region right here. It's Columbia River. Um, and enter off and go up into Lesser Slave Lake, creating reservoirs, creating huge lifts, pumps, irrigating the entire prairie region, and then filtering off into various lakes like Superior and into the Hudson's. Um, so this, what we're looking at up here, the Peace River program, the Two River Policy of Bennett, is directly... Uh, this, is, this is directly part of the, the Ralph Parsons uh, blueprint. So, the Columbia River is as well. And just to put some meat on the bones to that assertion, in 61, a scandal erupted because a, a premier of a province is never, ever, they never meet with a sitting head of state of the United States. That's really rare. And in the course of this conference that was happening in, in, uh, in Seattle, uh, for this guy's uh, birthday or something, but this is 1961 in November, and Bennett spends hours and hours in a closed door meeting with JFK the whole time. There's no pictures available of both of these guys together, but everyone wants to know what's going on. Everyone was tight-lipped about it. Uh, 
But looking at what JFK was advocating uh, just from the Nawab in 1964 video, looking at the top-down conception of this one program, right, for Nawapa, uh, this was all of the discussion. This is what everybody was talking about. And so finally, the treaty is signed, 1964, by Lester B. Pearson and uh, Lyndon Johnson, and W.A.C. Bennett there in the middle, and things go through. So you got the ratification of the treaty in 64, all is set to go. This is the, uh, just to give some aerial views here, just to get a visceral sense of it, that's the, the W.A.C. Bennett Dam on the Peace River. It was completed in 1967. It's an earth dam, isn't it? It's an earth dam, the second biggest one in the world, yeah. Then uh, another version here that has the Williston Reservoir. Um, yeah, this is what's connecting to the North Superior uh, River systems. Uh, these were all finished by within 1967 to 73. Okay, the Duncan Dam. That was the first dam to be completed in 67. You have the Hugh Keenly Side Dam in Arrow Lakes Reservoir, and the Libby Dam, and the Mika Dam. And the Mika Dam actually was the first to start using the Rocky Mountain Trench as a reservoir. So about a hundred. Uh, miles of the Rocky Mountain Trench were used for the first time as a reservoir with this dam. So we, we're starting to get an idea of how that works. Okay. So it's really important to have an idea of the mind and, mind and matter, right? You're dealing with a phenomenon here that transcends the individual lives on the stage. You've got a process of the conceptions accumulatively of people uh, who are following a common principle of what is man, what is the universe that produced man such that we don't have to adapt to the constraints of empire, of arbitrary resource limitations. This is something which is ongoing, and this is transforming nature in a way that for the first time it becomes self-conscious. With the Nawapa program up until now, up before the Nawapa, we've been doing this in a less conscious way. It's been somewhat subconscious for most of human history. Right? the transformation of nature for the pr improvement of man. But this would be the first time that it becomes part of the actual self-conscious control right, of human creativity. But 1968 did happen. And we are at a point right now where this could very well become a reality as we see the complete 180 turn on the part of the most evil people in the world who we never would have thought would say the word glass eagle without spitting at the same time we're now calling for it. We have an awareness that nuclear war is on the agenda from the leadership of places like Russia, China, and leading circles even within the oligarchy who are realizing that they don't want to rule over a world that involves a uh, nuclear holocaust. And things like Nawapun is not just an option. But again, we'll get there in a sec, but 1968 did happen. There was one last, and I think this is important to look at from a Canadian standpoint too, um, there was one last push on the part of a grouping of individuals, um, you guys probably have heard of Jean Lesage and uh, Daniel Johnson Sr. Mm -hmm. okay. So in the course, and this is also, I didn't really go through this, but the Revolution Tranquille was a process that was begun really by Lesage uh, and people around him uh, in Quebec, which was based on the idea, again, of complete hydro development, right? Manage your resources, uh, modernize, get some industries going, and, where should I put this? Okay. On the one hand, the financing problem in Canada has always been a problem. We do have to get a national bank that's functional. We've never up until now had the Bank of Canada used the way it can be. Um, and that's a paradox, since the way the British have always controlled Canada has been by creating a very schismed, compartmentalized political society, a culturally um, scattered uh, identity, so you have all of these different compartmentalized cultures without any common sense of unified identity or what the hell are we as Canadians. That's a problem. Well, paradoxically, you have had the, the financial control top-down 
by a small, too big to fail institution in banking and uh, and government, and that's always been there since before Confederation. You've had a small, tightly knit oligarchy in finance, in our government, and you've had uh, a scattered, diffused political system for the people. But when we did develop, looking at people like W. A. C. Bennett, it was when it was when you had a nation a part of the nation that worked together with another part of the nation for something which created a greater wealth deep into the future. And the hydroelectric, just to get a taste of that, the, all of the hydroelectric projects that were started with the Revolution Tranquille and the development under Jean Lesage came from a financing of $100 million by W.A.C. Bennett. Right. So he, no loans could be provided from Ottawa whatsoever. There was a complete resistance to the idea of developing Canada. But when you had W.A.C. Bennett actually take the reins, a revenue stream was generated and that was a real investment made into the internal development of Canada. So British Columbia helped it now. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, it's kind of nice, huh? <laughs> so Daniel Johnson Sr. Um, invited, he was close friends with Charles de Gaulle. He visited France he spent a lot of time studying de Gaulle's methods, de Gaulle being, a, at this point, a convert to the American system, essentially, of Lincoln, of Lincoln and Roosevelt, and a collaborator uh, with John F. Kennedy and, and Robert, even. But, okay, so he gets the sense there of what this thing is about. De Gaulle comes and is invited to, to Quebec, where he tours for uh, several weeks, all across Quebec. Hmm? You've heard about this, right? I was... <laughs> You were there? Okay. He dropped the ball, I think. Vive le Québec libre! Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's that. Roger Rhubarb as a result of that. Yeah, yeah. Right before Richie Havens came on. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Richie Havens? Yeah. Freedom, freedom. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> um, but at the time, this was not the separatist movement we know and uh, hate today. This is a different beast. You're dealing with Daniel Johnson Sr., and this gives us a sense of why the Canadian identity today is so screwed up between the Francophone and the Anglophone community, right? Is that with the idea of Daniel Johnson Sr., he said, well, you know, we'll, 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 se we'll have separation if necessary, but not necessarily separation. That was his, like, major yeah. theme. Like, it was conditional. If, we, if we're brought to the point where we can't develop we're going to be forced to separate and become a nation. And he had an idea of a constitutional republic. Mm -hmm. So his concept was a Bank of Quebec as a national bank with a constitution modeled on that of the United States, with a congressional system modeled on that of the United States, to finance what was necessary to be financed. De Gaulle was obviously all for that. So this guy, um, this guy was a fighter. And he, he ended up dead at the unveiling of uh, a dam, the, the, the Manic... Uh, sank dam uh, in northern Quebec. Now, I've known people, and my grandfather was actually working on that dam and told me that if you dug up his body today, they say he died of a heart attack, but you'd find it riddled with bullets. Um, you real sneaky than that, you know. mm, well. I mean, that's just obvious. I don't know. Well, that's my grandfather. That's, that's my grandfather. I don't know. But, all to say, this was again, when the British can't, uh, get their way, mm -hmm. the last resort is always, yeah. And this is not something like they like doing. Because the, the, impor the important thing is a lot of people, they learn the wrong lesson, they say, well, that's why you shouldn't make waves. Whereas the real lesson you should learn is, well, no, these guys actually have exposed their weakness. Every time they have to kill a human being, right, they're exposed that there's something within an individual human being, as little physically as, as we are, that scares the hell out of this beast such that it has to go out of its way to eliminate that person. So that's actually a very empowering thing, that there's something in every individual that has the potential to scare the hell out of the system. They right? get assassinated. <laughs> huh. And these guys know what they're up against, you know? Yeah. And so that's, that's the type of, I mean, you just look at Quebec today, and everything that we have was all said to have been impossible. The idea of bringing uh, power lines all the way from northern Quebec 
with these Robert Barossa reservoirs up in <coughs> north of James Bay, down to population centers. Like, this is a huge freaking distance. This is like eight Frances, right, all locked up in here. That's huge. Yeah, underground, above ground, these are, but whole new technologies had to be developed to, tra to transmit that energy over such huge distances to places like Quebec City, like Montreal, other places. Because, I mean, it's going to be losing power along the way and other things, so you had to create whole new advanced systems, a lot of which were helped by, again, the power of the Peace River and the, the, the discoveries made by W.A.C. Bennett's team in discovering how do you trans transport energy from the Peace River all the way down to places like Vancouver. These were whole new discoveries that were said to have been completely impossible. The program, again, according to the conceptions of people like these folks, and like Hydra Quebec, when you look at their original feasibility studies uh, of that period, was that Quebec was supposed to, by the late 1980s, be 70% nuclear. The idea was, Hydra, that's, we're going to have to phase out of that at some point. We've got to go nuclear. And um, they, a lot of these engineers were totally surprised in the, in the mid-70s when they all of a sudden all of the nuclear contracts were canceled. Only one was built, and they were told to build all these hydroelectric dams. They were like, whoa, I thought we were, I, I just got my, my degree in physics, in, in nuclear physics, what, what am I doing? <laughs> so, but again, this is... So what, what determines the day of the Canadian identity? is It's not the, the Anglo-Franco uh, identity in Canada is not determined by uh, W.A.C. Bennett's uh, Anglophone America and... Uh, you know, Daniel Johnson Sr.'s Francophone America, or North America, is not determined by this idea. Uh, it's rather determined by <coughs> Lebec and Trudeau, right? This is the fundamental dynamic that has shaped, that shaped the modern Canadian's idea of what it means to be a Quebecois or a Canadian. And when you actually look at what was brought in with these guys, because again, the question is always, where did say, the anti-Americanism didn't exist before that. You had the biggest cooperative pro policies and prospects for economic growth on all player on our, all parties before this. What occurred uh, with these two puppets? Because René Lévesque, this guy was picked up by literally British intelligence while he was in World War II and became a little announcer for the BBC, yeah. or, and then became part of the CBC as a little celebrity. But this guy was an intelligence operative working out of New York as well. And again, recruited completely by British intel. This guy founds, he's originally part of this Daniel Johnson senior party. He breaks off. The senior's part of the National uh, uh, Duplessis uh, Squad. What was that? Uh, na the Union Nationale, the National Union, which wasn't as bad as a lot of people think. There was, some, there was a lot of progressive policies there. But this guy breaks off and ends up forming the Parti Québécois, right? Complete. Mm -hmm. Québec identity is now not nation building, moving Earth. It's not about. They had the big at the, at the time of, of René Lévesque, there was most the most engineers per capita being produced out of Quebec than any other part of the world, and it became completely based on language. Right. So the idea was met my language against those mm -hmm. colonialists that want to impose their their Anglophonism on me, and it became a, a total xenophobic logic. True, of course, having played right into the whole policy, bringing in martial law into Quebec, while you had the RCMP initiating the FT, uh, FLQ's terrorist policy of, you know, kidnapping and killings, and this was openly being done. I mean, this is, even at that time, you had media reports mm -hmm. by mass media of the day that were reporting on how the RCMP was being caught, passing themselves off as FLQ terrorists. This was known, mm -hmm. right? And so you have a complete shock therapy in the part of the population of Quebec, uh, which creates a complete resonance for generations. And this is a guy I just dug up uh, a couple of days ago. I, I passed by his name in the Dope Incorporated book, uh, but then I did a little bit of work on him this morning and discovered he's a little bit more than I thought he was. This is a little uh, character named Walter Lockhart Gordon, who essentially designed the policies of Trudeau. This guy's also seen by a lot of, and this is tragic, this is really tragic, because a lot of the organizations around 9-11 Truth and uh, seemingly even CAP patriotic organizations like the Canadian Action Party and others uh, praise this guy for being the true patriot and founder, you know, of the 
new nationalist policy of Canada, which is an ideology he founded and brought in, into Trudeau. New nationalism was what? Well, well, first of all, who is he, right? Finance minister from 1963 to 65. He was the president of the Privy Council from 67 to 68, right? And that is the most powerful position, really. The, the governor general is actually not as powerful as the president of the Privy Council that runs the entire Privy Council office. Um, committee for he started the Committee for an Independent Canada, and the, and he created the Canadian Development Corporation to quote buy back Canada in 1971. And this is a so-called hero, just to get a sense of what, because again, where does this anti-American idea come from? Well, he's quoted in uh, the Toronto Star Forum uh, conference in 1970 as saying, the U.S. is an aggressive neighbor interfering in Can Canada's desire to be left alone and run its own business. Canadians have been foolish for allowing so many enterprises to have been acquired, mostly by enterprising Americans over the last 25 years. To suggest that it makes no difference who actually owns and therefore controls these enterprises indicates a remarkable lack of knowledge of the way in which the business operates and the way human nature ticks. Canada should announce a clear and positive policy to recover great control over the economy and then to apply it. It would like to see this done before the only alternative left which would be a, a widespread, widespread scheme of expropriation and nationalization of the kind advocated by the radical left. So, what does Trudeau bring in? Well, on the one hand, of bringing the entire Privy Council office into his inner cabinet, essentially by expanding the, the uh, Prime Minister's uh, council from 40 to 95, he brings in the, the program of absolute uh, tariff on U.S. imports, the absolute uh, limited ownership of, by any U.S. company of Canadian corporations or businesses, right? You couldn't have anything more than 10 or 20 percent of ownership if you were an American enterprise mm -hmm. in a Canadian institution. Um, and there's a slew of just programs that on the surface seemed, and I actually used to like Trudeau for this reason, right? Because on the surface it seemed like, hey, that's a protective nationalist policy. I like that. Right. And then you realize, well, what's the idea of governing this mechanism? Because the mechanism itself is not good or bad. It's a mechanism. Is it? Right. This, this is the thing. Because what's he saying here? The, nation, the nature of Canada's nationalism, this new nationalism, is to be left alone and do its thing. Right? The idea of nation state to just be left alone. Is that really what a nation is, is designed to do? To no. Just, no. 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 West exactly. We have to develop the other, our develop neighbors, as we develop ourselves. ourselves. Exactly. The common good. So it's an active. It's not a passive institution. It's not no. a passive idea. It's an active idea, and that's a nation state. That's sovereignty. So the redefinition of sovereignty today has become just that. You know, that's why that's the argument of world and world government. Because, you know, why have all of these localized nations trying to open up their borders to not do anything so that the markets can take over when it could be done so much more efficiently by, you know, a dictatorship of a small, you know, enlightened elite? We don't have any of those nationalist qualms or wanting to protect our people or something like that, like the Greek president might have or something. So you just need to transcend this idea of the sovereign nation state and the Westphalian system of, you know, respecting each other's borders to become more enlightened. But the whole thing's a fraud. It's based on no mind, right? Because that's the free market system. It's based on the idea that there, you sever mind from any decision-making process of the future of where your society needs to go for the good of all. So if you sever mind, you can make this type of argumentation like this guy does. Mm -hmm. But the second you introduce conceptions of forecasting, right, of having an insight into where present decisions have created a boundary condition in the future, as soon as that foresight comes into play of acting on the future, like what we're doing now with Glass-Steagall, because we know that this, this collapse is going to strike, we can act now before the, that blows by separating the banks, doing this orderly reorganization, wiping out the bad debt, and then remobilizing for a national bank to issue the public credit necessary to rebuild our society based on the types of pro, uh, precedents set forth with Nwapa. And looking at it, it's really... Because a lot of people say, and you'll get this if you guys end up doing more uh, political outreach 
which I hope everyone here does do, I like Glass-Steagall. People will say in the legislature, they'll say it in Ottawa, that I like Glass-Steagall. I see that that makes sense. National banking even, you know, that, that makes sense. But Nawampa, all these big projects, state, Arctic development, uh, we, are, we don't have a consensus on that. The people won't like that. And the idea is Glass-Steagall and national banking won't work if you don't have a new deal to build afterwards, right? Roosevelt would have not been anything if he just did Glass-Steagall and he started using the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Yeah. If he just did that and said, okay, let's let the markets take over now, like Mark Carney is proposing to do, even though he's bashing LIBOR, Mark Carney is still saying, oh, instead of having the banks uh, d determine what the rates, uh, the interest rates among the bank and lending is going to be, let's just make it the, the free markets. Right? This type of logic is going to kill us. That would've, Hitler would have won that war. Right? So you need to have a, a, you have a negative uh, hypothesis just to prove what's wrong, what doesn't work. That's Glass-Steagall. That's national banking. Put out the fire now. But then the house has already on, it's been on fire for a long time. You've got to rebuild the new structure. So you need a positive principle now right, to get on board with what we should have been doing already for the past 50, 60 years. And that's really what our job is. So we've got to get more people into these meetings. This is good. It's a nice turnout to see this. Um, I wish we could get this all the time on the East Coast. But we should all uh, really do the outreach necessary, get invitations out there, get our, you know, our friends and family and everybody that we don't even know to start getting active and contribute. You know, like really, we're at the end of the system. So the change is now. And uh, I think I'll just end it with that. Mm -hmm. I think that was great.